greetings and welcome back to racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, this week's lecture will be for the week of October 11th through the 15th. Um, so uh, you will probably be watching this video sometime during that week. If you look on your syllabus, it says that the readings for this week are the racialization of Islamophobia essay four in your textbook and, the, and deconstructing myths about Muslims essay 10 in your textbook. So that is what we're going to cover in this lecture today. Okay. Uh, if you will uh, look at, um, let me see, uh, the next slide, which says these are the two things that we're going to talk about the racialization of Islamophobia and deconstructing myths about Muslims. Okay, so those are the two main topics that we're going to be discussing uh, for this week. First thing that is important uh, to note is that um, you have a quiz two, and your quiz two uh, will be available or is available uh, on October 11th. So hopefully you're watching this on or before, or, you know, whatever day, October 11th, but you were told about your quiz last week. So in the last lecture video, so hopefully you watched it. Hopefully you looked at the PowerPoint. So you know about the quiz. And so your quiz, uh, you have a quiz available on October 11th and it will cover the reading essay for racialization of Islamophobia. So if you're watching this on October 11th, then it is today. And so if you're watching it on October 11th, then make sure that you do the quiz today because it is due by uh, October 12th, uh, 1 p.m. So you will have the quiz. The quiz will be, uh, again, the quiz, uh, quiz will be available October 11th, and you will have that day and then the next day to complete it. Um, the quiz has five to 10 questions related to the reading. The questions to the quiz will be available under files, reading quizzes, entitled Quiz to Islamophobia at 1 p.m. on Monday, October 11th, and you will have 24 hours until 1 p.m. October 12th, Tuesday to complete it, okay? So you have 24 hours to complete the quiz. You already know the rules around quizzes, so that is that. On a separate Microsoft Word document, you'll record your answers to the questions. Then you will go to the assignments link, and click on where it says reading quizzes and then the portal where it says quiz two, Islamophobia. And then you will upload the answers there. No submissions after the deadline will be graded under any circumstances. So if you have questions, reach out to me during my office hours and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you might have, but um, that is it. So your deadline for the quiz, is October 12th, <clears throat> 1 p.m. Tuesday. It'll be available to you October 11th, Monday. Okay. So, yes, that should cover everything. Uh, let's see. Also, um, next Monday, October 18th, is an instructional day. Okay. So, you have no classes on that day. So, that means. Um, you know, typically I upload things or whatever that Monday. I still might upload something that Monday, but pretty much anything that you need to do, you won't have to watch anything for that Monday. Now, I'm going to just let you know ahead of time that I'm going to give you an assignment at the end of this lecture. Let me make sure I'm telling this right. Yes, that will be due anytime before next Monday, but the, the cutoff time will be next Monday. But you can do it at any point. Right, that's the purpose of it. So you're being assigned it whenever, but next Monday is an instructional day. So you won't have to watch a video or anything like that next Monday. More than likely, again, I'll probably still have stuff uploaded, but you won't have to watch anything until, you know, next Tuesday or Wednesday or whenever. Um, but you can if you want to, because again, this is 
distance learning. So consider that kind of like a, a day off, if you will. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with the uh, with the information for this week. So if you can think about it, uh, what event caused the biggest increase in Muslim hate in the past 20 years? Think about what event caused the biggest increase in Muslim hate in the past 20 years. And you can think about it, you can pause the video if you would like to, um, and just kind of, you know, mull over it. What event caused the biggest increase in Muslim hate in the past 20 years? And most people will probably say, you probably think of a number of different things. Some of you may have been born, or if, if you were born, you were very, very, very small <laughs> at this time, um, or you may not have been born at this time. But 9-11, uh, right? 9-11 was the big kind of event that occurred in the past 20 years, uh, I think actually this year marks the 20th year of 9-11 that really led to hate and hatred among Muslims, right? Um, particularly people from, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, particularly people from Afghanistan. Um, and so you had people from these particular countries uh, typically countries that had a very large Muslim population uh, that a lot of the United States citizens would fear. Uh, from that time, you would see a lot of marches uh, related to um, banning Muslims. You would see the burning of mosques. You would see Muslims being beat in the streets during, you know, during or shortly after this time of 9-11, because it was the idea that Muslims in general uh, people from the area of, you know, Afghanistan or or or, um, or any of those areas had this deep-seated hatred for the United States. And not just a deep-seated hatred, but actually wanted to see the United States, you know, in peril or in shambles or wanted to kill or do violence to U.S. citizens. And so because of that, um, there was this large increase, there was this large um, um, uh, large sentiments or uh, very strong sentiments of anti-Muslim hate during that time. Uh, everybody was, anybody who um, maybe had the look of being a Muslim or had the look of being from the area of the country, or I'm sorry, the area of the world, um, were automatically labeled Muslims, even if they weren't. Um, they would automatically be labeled Muslims and then they would automatically be labeled terrorists. Um, you could even look at funny SNL clips or comedians or whatever from that time period um, where they would make these kind of jokes, right? About everybody from the United States being afraid of the Taliban or afraid of Muslims during that time. Um, and although these are some jokes that you may see from like, like I said, SNL clips or comedians and things of that nature, it was a real situation and, and real people suffered, uh, particularly Muslims suffered because of the anti-Muslim hate that was very pronounced during that time. And so this hate of Muslims uh, particularly during this time. And then we will, all, we will also see later on, there became this kind of resurgence later, is uh, it's called Islamophobia. And Islamophobia is this unfounded fear of Islam and the negative experiences surrounding it, okay? Notice that in the definition, it says it is an unfounded fear of Islam, meaning that uh, the people who are having this fear of people who are Muslims or the religion of Islam, um, it's, it's for the most part based on uh, myths, based on stereotypes, 
based on um, false accusations or false ideas about Muslims. Now, some people would respond, some people may respond by saying, well, no, it's not unfounded. The people who um, attacked the Twin Towers, the people who bombed the Twin Towers, the people who bombed the Pentagon at that time were indeed people of, or uh, um, people from a particular country, right? You had people uh, such as someone like a Saddam Hussein or someone like Osama bin Laden. Um, these people, uh, some people would describe them as being Muslim, right? Or following the teachings of Islam. And there were people on that plane who followed the teachings of Islam, claimed to be Muslim, and those people did in fact do what it is um, that we saw. They did in fact um, participate in a terrorist attack against the United States. So some people may say, well, that fear is not unfounded. We can see the results of it. And the question then remains. Well, is it a fear of the entire, is that a representation of the, of the religion of Islam? Is that a representation of that entire belief system? Number one, Islam isn't a religion, it's a belief system, right? Just like Christianity. Christianity is a belief system. Now you have a lot of different religious denominations within Christianity. You have Southern Baptists, you have Protestants, you have Episcopalians, you have um, a lot of you know, under Protestants, you have so many different groups, right? Um, you have Seventh Day Adventists, you have um, um, Mormons, you you have all these different groups under the belief system of Christianity, right? Muslims or Islam, it's the same way, right? You have Orthodox Muslims, you have Sunni Muslims, you have the Nation of Islam, you have all of these different groups under the umbrella of Islam, right? And so it's very important that we don't take the actions of some people and apply it to the entire belief system of Islam. Because, and we'll see this later on in an activity, that we wouldn't necessarily want that done in every aspect or with every belief system or religion for that matter. <clears throat> so when we say that the fear is unfounded, what we're saying is that a fear of Islam is unfounded because there is nothing in, with, within history that suggests that everyone on earth needs to be afraid of every person who is Muslim because there is nothing within Islam that teaches that there should be this mass hatred towards people and promotes violence towards a, a, a large group of people for terrorist reasons, right? There's nothing in the teachings of Islam that would promote that. And in fact, many Muslims across the world um, uh, disregarded and uh, disassociated themselves with those people who participated in those terrorist attacks because those attacks, violent attacks and killing of innocent people is not something that um, is taught or is promoted in Islam. Now, Islamophobia is very important, uh, particularly to the authors of this text because what they're saying is that Islamophobia is not just about fearing people of a particular religion. It's also about including the understanding of race when we're assessing Islam. Islam is not just about a religion. And when, when people think about Muslims or when people think about Islam or when people think about banning Muslims or banning Islam or burning down mosques, there is a particular race that is being thought about. There are racialized, or there's a certain racialization, what, what, your, what the authors call racialization when it comes to Muslims, okay? And so most people see 
religion and race as these separate entities, right? Because somebody is of a particular religion, it doesn't necessarily mean they're of a particular race. Um, and so we can talk about religion and not talk about race. Some people may say, well, when I'm talking to, if, if people have an issue with Christianity, if people have an issue with someone being a Christian or Christians, oftentimes that is not necessarily linked to a particular race because people may say, well, that's, that's two different things. Religion you choose. Race you may not necessarily choose unless you're passing. And we talked about that before. <clears throat> But generally speaking, a person's not going to choose their race, but you can choose a religion. You can decide whether you're going to follow a religion or not. So most people will see these as two separate things and they treat them as such. And so when you take away race out of, uh, take away the assessment of race when looking at religion, then a lot of times what you end up finding and what you end up seeing is that we're missing a very important piece of how religion can be used as a form of oppression and how particular religious groups can be oppressed alongside racial oppression. And furthermore, how religion can function as this, um, what Patricia Hill Collins calls as part of the matrices of oppression, of, of oppression or as part of the matrices of domination where you have people who embody one group or who embody one body, who are in one body, but have several parts of them. And so you have people who may be of a particular religion that may be oppressed within a certain context. And then those same people are also of a race body within a particular context that also may be oppressed. So let's say, for example, you have a black person who is a Muslim a person who's racist and a person who's Islamophobic would say or have this, these multiple forms of hatred towards that person, not only because they're Black, but also because they're Muslim. Or even the state can have these multiple forms of oppression towards somebody, not just because of their race, but also because of their religion. So it's important for us to realize, and this is what the authors are arguing, that religion and race have more in common then we may realize, and it is important that within Islamophobia, we also include how Islamophobia is racialized and the same way in which we um, racialize people, racialize situations, and the same way in which we look at race and use race as this dominant form of oppression, it is in that same way that it can be done when um, discriminating against someone based on their religious beliefs. All right, let's go to the next slide. So the authors of this text <clears throat> say that there are three elements of racism. So talking about race and religion and how they go hand in hand. Talk about three elements of racism. The first element of racism is a set of ideas, a set of ideas. And so racism starts with ideas. It starts with concepts, it starts with an ideology, and it starts with this belief that the human race, right, the fact that we're all human can be divided into different groups, groups being white, one group being white, one group being black, one group being Asian, one group being Native American or indigenous Americans, one group being Latinx. And so it is this idea that this human race is now broken up into these different groups. And then this idea that there are natural characteristics derived from the culture or physical appearance or both. So because a person is a part of a specific group, whether white, black, Latinx, et cetera, 
there are these natural characteristics that are innate in them. That's what racism, that's, that, that is one of the elements of it. That's how it starts. Because you're part of this group, these are natural characteristics that come from you. They can be cultural, they can be physical. So if you're part of this group, you're naturally smart. If you're part of this group, you can naturally run faster. If you're part of this group, you're naturally a hard worker. If you're part of this group, you're naturally a criminal. If you're part of this group, you're naturally good with money. If you you see what I'm saying? So there are these certain ideas that we have about each one of these racial categories that have been divided out of the human race. And so the second element of racism is that there are historical there is a historical power of relationships. So over time, each of these groups are subject to racialization. And they're treated as if these characteristics are natural and innate in every member of the group. That's what we talked about before uh, with a set of ideas. And then with there being this historical power of relationships, you have where within that relate within the re the interrelationships between the racial groups, you have some groups that are in power over other groups, or there could or there can be um, a struggle for power, whether it's power over oneself, one's body, power over another. So there is a history of power dynamics between these groups that affect the history of these groups. And the power dynamics of these groups are largely formed out of a racialization, adding on natural characteristics based on race for these groups bringing about racialized or another part of racialization is also thinking of the way in which a situation perpetuates or reinforces race or racism. So even racializing certain situations. So we see the way that these sets of ideas are perpetuated in a situation. We see where sets of I ideas have this, hist or we see where the historical power of relationships can come out of these situations. We see that. And so then we say, well, the third element of racism comes from the forms of discrimination, where there are actual practices that range on a spectrum that reinforce these ideas around natural characteristics applied to, applied to the distinct groups. Meaning when we have forms of discrimination, we say, well, because you are part of this group and you're naturally a criminal, now there, is, there has been historical power between the groups that says, that this, this group is a criminal and the group that is being criminalized, now the form of discrimination says, now we have to pass a policy that says it is okay, we talked about this last week, that it is okay for you to be, it is okay for you to be stop and frisk. It is okay for more people that look like you to go to prison because you all are naturally criminals. You're always doing something wrong. You're always involved in some criminal activity. The form of discrimination can be a, an advantage because you are a part of this group. We know that you are more likely to be successful. We know if you start a business, more than likely it will be successful. So guess what? I am going to contribute resources to your group. It'll be a lot easier for you to have the financial backing to do what you need to do because we believe in your group. Your group is naturally more business savvy, naturally smarter. 
And so forms of discrimination, there's a range. When people say, I'm not racist or I'm, I don't practice discrimination, that's because most of the time they're thinking about the most egregious forms of discrimination. Rarely are they thinking about the smaller ways in which discrimination can still exist, in which racism can still exist. Rarely are they thinking about the microaggressions that one can reinforce when dealing with some kind of racialized situation. And so again, discriminatory practices or racist practices go on a spectrum, whether it be a person being denied access to material, whether they're denied resources that they need, that is a form of discrimination or racism, all the way up until you have the genocide of a specific group. So racism is not just slavery. Racism is not just the Holocaust. Those are egregious forms of the same race, race, racist spectrum that a person who was denied entry into a country club, a person who was um, questioned by authority simply because of the way that they look or the color of their skin. All of it is still racist. They're just these different forms and it lives on a spectrum. And so these are the three elements of racism, but we can see how these three elements, which of, of what we call racialization, or part of the racialization process, we'll, we'll go deeper into racialization in the next slide, but part of the racialization process, part of racism, um, this can be applied to faith groups, particularly Muslims. All the major world faiths, before we get into how uh, faith systems can be racialized, all of the major world faiths include a variety of people from all different races, a variety of people from all different races. You can have uh, Muslims who are white, Muslims who are black, Muslims who are Asian, Christians who are um, Australian, Christians who are Latinx, Buddhists who are black, Buddhists who are white, Zoroastrianists, Confucianists, who are Native American, who are Latinx. I mean, literally many of the, again, the major groups, there are certain, certain smaller religious groups that are very distinct among certain people. But your major groups draw people from everywhere. Christians, everywhere. Muslims, everywhere. Buddhists, everywhere. Hindus, everywhere. Now, again, there are certain countries that are kind of known to have a majority of people who are of a particular religion, right? If you think about the United States, again, it's not a Christian nation, but it is largely run by people who subscribe to Christian ideas. And that probably won't change very much <laughs> in the near future. Egypt, largely run by people who subscribe to Muslim ideas. And so on. Indians may be largely Hindu. People from India may be largely Hindu. People from Thailand, more than likely will be Buddhist, right? And so you have certain countries that are likely to be tied to a specific religion. However, these religious, the religious influence of these groups span the entire globe. And so Islam is a religion that is comprised of people from from all kinds of racial groups. All kinds of racial groups. I think it's important that we think about Malcolm X and look at the story of Malcolm X. Malcolm X um, 
Most of you have probably heard, heard his name. Um, some of you may have a better understanding of Malcolm X maybe than, than some others. But Malcolm X was a black man who I believe, I believe he was born in Arkansas. Um, eventually moved to Boston and then to Harlem, New York. Um, he was an African-American man, very smart, experienced a lot of racism in the 1930s and in the 1940s. He would eventually um, drop out of school because of racism and largely because of racism and poverty and then begin to find different ways in which to get money and started getting involved with illegal activity. He was arrested, put in prison. And while in prison, he was introduced to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who was the leader of the Black Muslim movement at that time. These Black Muslims allied themselves with the larger teachings of Islam and the religion of Islam but looked at it and practiced it in a way that worked for African-Americans, right? So he aligned himself with this particular group, the Nation of Islam, and he became a Muslim. And he learned about the teachings of Islam through being a part of this group. One thing that he learned out of these teachings, and not, well, he didn't necessarily learn this from the teachings, but he, felt this way throughout his life because he experienced so much racism was that he gained this deep-seated hatred for racism and this deep-seated hatred for people who oppressed other people. In fact, he would go on record as speaking very ill about uh, white supremacy and particularly white people, right? And so him, and many other people who are part of this group had very ill feelings about white people in general, not because they were white, but because of the different things that they experienced while being black in America. For example, Malcolm X, his mother was taken to an institution and put in a psychological ward and the state took him and his brothers and sisters away from his mother. Um, not because she was crazy, but because she was impoverished. And so because she was impoverished and because their father was murdered by the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan, uh, he was kidnapped by the Klan in that state, put on some railroad tracks, and then the train came and split his father in half. And that's how he died. Also, because Malcolm X was told by his teachers and by uh, white people that he could not be anything more than a janitor or uh, um, a lower, low skilled worker because of his race, he believed it. And so because he had experienced so many negative racist things throughout his life, he then began to latch on to ideas that white people in general, it appeared because of everything that he had been through, were racist and were evil. Um, he spent a lot of his time teaching, and he spent a lot of his time um, empowering Black communities, teaching Black people to own their own businesses, to open their own businesses, to learn about their true African selves, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so with that being said, as he began to develop his own ideas, his own philosophies, especially around the idea around Islam, he decided that he would participate in one of the five pillars of Islam which is to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. So he borrowed some money from his sister because his sister had more money than he did at the time. Um, she was a nurse. He borrowed some money from her and he took a pilgrimage to Mecca. When you click on this link on this slide, this link will uh, show you or describe how his ideas began to change once he made his pilgrimage to Mecca, because this would be the first time that he would experience Islam in a much bigger way, outside of just the US context, outside of just understanding Islam within the context of black people and white people and the tension that white people tended to have about black people in the United States, outside of racism, outside of Jim Crow, 
All of this, of course, is during the civil rights movement. So think about it within that era. Um, and this is his first time interacting with Muslims outside of that context when he makes his pilgrimage to Mecca and when he visits Saudi Arabia. And so I want you to look at this link. This is a, a clip from the movie Malcolm X, if you've never seen the movie with Denzel Washington. There's a clip from the movie where he, he goes to Mecca and he talks about his experiences. So I want you to pause this video here. I want you to go there, watch this link, and then come back. And then let's talk about these questions. All right, so when looking at this clip, how did race and racism shape the way Malcolm X saw religion? Right? How did religion, um, because of what he experienced as it pertained to race and racism, what did this religion do for him? based on what you may know already about Malcolm X, but also based on uh, what you saw in this clip. And then how did this pilgrimage to Mecca change the way he understood race? What were some of the things that he said in this, in this clip that helped him gain a different understanding around race? something that was a bit more complicated than he thought it was. <clears throat> and if you've ever never read the, the autobiography of Malcolm X, I would highly encourage you, especially as college students, to read that text. Um, Malcolm X's autobiography is one of the most read books uh, I definitely in the, in the US lexicon um, and still a, a bestseller around the world because you see this complicated development of a human being based on external circumstances. Um, so I would, I would highly suggest that you read it in. And not only that, but there's also another book called, um, I think it's called A Man Reinvented or something like that um, by Manny Marable. He was a African-American studies professor, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant historian um, who also did a, a piece on Malcolm. Um, if you're interested in, in the topic. So there have been some other um, pieces on Malcolm, other um, books that gather and tease out some things that uh, Alex Haley didn't necessarily do in the autobiography. So I want you to think about those questions. And I actually, I don't answer them directly because I want you to come up with your own answers. But we're going to kind of talk about some of the some of these answers um, as we move forward. So let's go to the next slide. How can religion be raced? Okay, how can religion be raced? So race has been defined by cultural and physical characteristics. And we talked about that earlier, but we also define Islam as religion and as a culture. So just like race, Islam is not just a religion. It's a part of a person's cultural identity. There are certain things that people around the world think about certain cultural traits, certain traditions, certain ideas, whether positive or negative or indifferent, that we as human beings ascribe to Islam. So Islam is not just a religion, it's a culture. It's a cultural group, <clears throat> just like any other cultural group, just like certain racial groups have cultural characteristics that are ascribed to them. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody in that group practices that culture, but it is something that's unique to that culture. For example, um, let's take Kwanzaa, for instance. Kwanzaa is an African-American holiday, but every Black person doesn't celebrate it. But it is a cultural holiday. So let's take, uh, forgive me if I say it wrong, a Kinsey, a Kinsey and Era, I believe. 
that is something that is practiced by Latinx people, but every Latinx person may not practice or participate in a Kensian era, right? Um, Chinese New Year. Oh, I used to love going to my professor. I had a professor who um, would celebrate Chinese New Year at her house and would bring a lot of us PhD students. She would invite us to her house for Chinese New Year. Um, and it was always a lot of fun. Um, but every Chinese person may not practice that, but it is a cultural holiday that is ascribed to that particular uh, racial group, even if every race, even if every group within that race does not practice it. It's the same way with Islam. There are certain cultural ideas that are ascribed to Islam, which makes it not only a religion, but it's also viewed as a culture, which is the reason why Islam can also be racialized. And when we talk about something being racialized, it means that it entails ascribing certain sets of characteristics that are seen as being inherent to the members of that group. That's what it means to racialize something. So you take physical or you take cultural traits that, that could be related to skin tone, that could be related to pigment, that could be related to language. We talked about language not too long ago. That could be related to clothing, religious practices, et cetera. And we say that because of these cultural traits, there are certain ideas or characteristics that are inherent in these people. How does this relate to Islamophobia? Well, many people say that because of the religious practices, which is a cultural trait right here in the definition of racialization, religious practices is a cultural trait of Islam, violence is inherent Terrorism is inherent in these people. So we have ascribed a characteristics of violence as inherent to Muslims because of this cultural trait of Islam. That is, that is the practice of racialization. That is essentially what racialization is. And so racial, when, when, when we racialize something or when we racialize people, whether we racialize a race or racialize a religious group, we do three things. One, we draw a line around all its members. That means every member of that group does this thing. We make them a monolithic group. And then number two, we initiate or we instigate feelings of weakness. Right? These people, all of these people do this thing. So first thing is we draw a line around the whole group. The whole group is together. They're a monolith. And then there is a weakness, which means everybody does a particular thing. And then lastly, we ascribe certain characteristics about that we-ness, that group, that may not be true. That is essentially the three things that we do when we racialize a group. And so Muslims and Jews are examples of this, of this racialization. You're talking about Muslims specifically in this, in this uh, lecture, but Jews historically have been subject to this. Obviously the most um, popular example would be the Holocaust. That's the most popular example. Ideas that this group was responsible for the underdevelopment of Germany post-World War I. 
This group was responsible for the high levels of unemployment, the high levels of death among white Germans, while this group was holding on and hoarding all of the resources for them and their people, even though they were not originally from this area. So the first thing that Hitler did was he drew a line around the whole, all of the Jews and said, all of them are the same. All of them feel the same thing and do the same thing. And then all of them are greedy, all of them hate Germans, all of them are the, the reasons why many of us are suffering right now. And so now there are these characteristics that are placed on this group that were not true, thus leading to him rising in power, him eventually being the leader of Germany and instigating the Holocaust. And so these people, the Muslims and Jews, again, have historically been subject to this racism because of their culture, because of their identity. And this is done in many, again, in many ways, it could be your culture, your identity, your physical appearance, the way you dress. Muslims have oftentimes been criticized or accosted or violently um, or, or been subject to violence because of the way that they dress. Women, Muslim women have been raped because they decide to cover themselves up. So they've been subject to rape. And so this is all a part of, again, racialization. and certain characteristics that we ascribe to people solely based on their cultural or their physical traits. Now, one of the things we, we can go to the next slide. One of the things we talked about was um, how we look at, now that we're at, at this racialization point, how we look at specific groups based on the religion, right? So let's take Afghans, for instance, right? Let's take Afghans, for instance, or people who are, uh, who live in the countries that make up the Muslim Brotherhood, Egyptians, Saudi Arabia. Right. So in looking at people that are from this country, not knowing their religion, not knowing if they're Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, agnostic, atheist, a lot of times when we see certain images, we apply that to the race. That means when we see certain images, like the ones here on this slide, some people will say that is a representation of Afghans and we need to protect ourselves from that group. We're gonna see an example of that later. Not just protect ourselves from the, from the people that subscribe to that religion, but the people that also subscribe to that religion and or look like them. Because if it was the religion, if it was just Muslims, then there will be a whole lot more white people and a whole lot more black people. And when I say black, I mean people that look black like me or look African-American who would be subject to violence against them. But oftentimes, when we say Muslim ban, when we say down with Muslims or down with the Taliban or whatever, we're thinking about people from a specific country. 
And what we're going to find when we go later on into the myths about Muslims, when we go on into SA10, we're going to we're going to tease that out. But for right now, we're just looking at it from this perspective. Is this religious extremism? Would, would somebody say people who are holding up a sign that says Islam will dominate the world or burning the American flag, would this be an example of being a religious extremist with these people promoting religious extremism? Some may say yes. Some may say, yeah, that is very extreme. It's violent. You're burning people's flags, which can be a sign of violence toward those people or toward that country. So yes, that's, that's, that's extreme. However, well, I don't know if I want to go there yet. So yeah, I'll just say some people may consider that extreme. And then some people may say, well, it's not a reflection of all the people, but those people are extreme. People who are doing that. Let's go to the next slide. This is a picture of the Ku Klux Klan in their white hoods. In the picture with them, looks like they might be in a church or if they're not in a church, they're in some auditorium that says, Jesus saves. Which alludes to the fact that, and it's very big, so it's safe to assume that these people are Christians or would align themselves with Christianity or the Christian church. And if we look over on the left side, their right, our left, looks like there's an American flag, appears to be an American flag off in the corner. So with the assumption that there's an American flag off in the corner, a person may say these are Americans, people who are citizens of the United States, people who are Christians, wearing the garb of a group that has terrorized other US citizens and continue to terrorize other US citizens, not just in the past, but presently. They also promote a specific religion. They promote Christianity because it clearly says that Jesus saves in the background, which lets us know more than likely they're Christian. Is this religious extremism as well? Would somebody argue that? Is it safe to say that there is no difference between the previous pictures? the previous picture in this one, or is, is there a difference? Something for you to think about. Is there a difference between these two pictures? Pause the video, you can talk to your roommate, friends, you can email me, talk to me if you want to about it. But it's an interesting thought. But then this is where the racialization kicks in. Because a person may argue, well, this is not representative of Christianity. And when people think about Christianity, even white people who think about Christianity, who don't necessarily align, who, who are not necessarily aligned with the teachings of the Ku Klux Klan, will say, well, this is an offshoot group. This is a group that was just crazy and they were racist and they were bad and they did bad things. But in general, Christianity isn't like this. Christianity is good. Christianity is positive. It's uplifting. It unites people under the teachings of Jesus.
And so that's what a lot of people may, may argue. However, if we go back to the previous slide, a lot of people would suggest, well, with this particular group, this religious extreme, this, this example of religious extremism, if a person were to see both of these pictures as religious extremism, would cause for protection from all people that look like those people, not that actually do the things that those people are doing, but who look like them. However, I've never heard of another country doing a ban on Christians and people that look like Christians. But if we go to the next slide, we do see that there has been an example of a ban on Muslims. And that ban on Muslims had a racial component to it because that ban on Muslims was not necessarily a ban on all Muslims in general, because you don't know that someone is a Muslim unless you see them in practice or you ask them if they're a Muslim and they say that they are. There's nothing on your driver's license or ID card that says you're a Muslim. So then how would a person know if a person is Muslim? Oh, they come from a Muslim country. And there's a lot of Christians in Egypt. A lot of Christians in Muslim countries. And although the United States is not a Christian country, it, is, uh, it definitely promotes Christianity more than uh, any other religion. But there's a lot of Muslims in the United States. So you don't know based on where somebody lives, what their religion most times, what their religion is. You won't know that. But that is one of the key differences between those two groups. Because when people think white or when people think Christian, they don't necessarily think Ku Klux Klan, even though they were a terrorist group. And when people think Klan, then people think to put um, um, a hatred, not a hatred, but a stop to the Klan, but not necessarily a stop to Christianity or white people in general. So we see that there is a difference in how we think about certain religious or belief systems and race. I kind of jumped ahead of myself, but we'll explain a little bit. We'll explain this more on this next slide. <clears throat> so, if we go to essay 10, we see that there are a lot of myths about Muslims. And what I want you to do is I want you to look at this link, click on this link, and I want you to tell me what are some myths about Muslims in this video that have started from US leaders and are, have now been adopted by citizens. What are some myths about Muslims in this video that have started from US leaders that have now been adopted by citizens? And so if we look at this clip, we see that these people are responding to when Donald Trump promoted a Muslim ban. Right. There's another video I was thinking about using that link, but I didn't really know if I had enough information where Donald Trump was responding to the killing and the terrorist attack in Orlando, Florida, in the gay club there. Um, and also using that as a reason why there should be this Muslim ban. And so there are these myths about Muslims in this video, these assumptions, number one, they said we have to protect American citizens from Muslims as if Muslims are not American citizens. So there's this racialized idea about who is American. So when people are saying we have to protect those Muslims, typically people that look a certain way from us American citizens, people who look white. There was uh, another person that said, we need to bomb the shit out of terrorists. But a large number of people killed in the terrorist attacks 
in Afghanistan and in other Asian countries were not terrorists, but they were regular citizens. So it's not like all the terrorists live in one country and they terrorize places and then go to one country and say, hey, we're just gonna chill here and enjoy the fact that we terrorize all these other countries and then America can send a bomb on that country. If it was that easy, the war on terrorism may not have been so long. Then again, who knows? But it's not that easy. Why? Because terrorists, <laughs> so-called terrorists, don't just stay in one area. They're everywhere. So if we say, well, we should just bomb terrorists, we're not really saying we want to bomb terrorists. What people who are saying that are saying we want to bomb people that look like terrorists. Because you can't just bomb. You can try to bomb one home, one terrorist home, without it affecting a lot of innocent people. When, 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 the, when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the end helped to end World War II, largely because the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, so they bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A lot of innocent people died. A lot of people that had nothing to do with the bombing at Pearl Harbor. A lot of innocent people died. Man, maybe the United States felt, well, you killed a lot of innocent people at Pearl Harbor. A lot of innocent Americans died. So some innocent Japanese people got to die too. Could be. A person can decide among themselves whether that's right or wrong, but that could be it. And so there are these myths about Muslims, there are these assumptions about Muslims that are made that then lead to Islamophobia. Another thing I want to talk about, uh, we can read section, um, we can read page 109. <clears throat> and the section that starts with in 2010, if we go there. It says, in 2010, on page 109, a Pew Research poll of 1,003 Americans found that 38% of Americans have an unfavorable view of Islam. 35% believe Islam is more likely, so that's more than one-third of Americans. It's quite a bit. Then more than one-third believe Islam is more likely than any other religions to encourage violence, okay? So that's a little bit more than one third. Some people may say, well, that's still two thirds that don't believe it. So it's still not that bad. Let's look at the next one. The next one says, more than half of Americans object to a mosque being built near their site, near the site of the World Trade Center. All this, despite the fact that 55% admit that they know very little about Islam. And yet Americans rank Muslims second only to atheists as a group that doesn't share their vision of American society. So one third, one, you know, a little bit more than a third, a little bit more than a third, which is quite a bit. And then more than half have some level of disdain, whether it's we believe all of them are violent or we don't think that a mosque needs to be built near the site of 9-11 the site of the World Trade Center, right? Some level of this thing, more than half of Americans feel. But then notice that the, the highest percentage was the percentage of people that said, I actually don't know a lot about, <laughs> about Islam. I don't know who these people are. I don't know anything about the religion. I have an uncle. Um, He's a, he's a medical doctor. Um, and we often have conversations about politics and society and stuff like that. And he 
uh, he's pretty conservative. And he says that he has these beliefs about Muslims and what they, and that there's this approach to violence or this inherent idea that uh, they handle things in a violent way. And I, um, he said all these things that, and though I'm not a Muslim, I learned and I know a lot about Islam through teachings and readings, um, through reading the Quran, through associating with other Muslims, through attending mosques myself. And almost everything he said, I've never seen, I've never found. And he himself has never read the Quran or has ever really studied Islam. And so I always found it interesting that though he has never studied it, doesn't know a lot about it, he had these very scathing ideas about the belief system. And it's a very brilliant medical doctor. And so I encourage, so, so number one, I say that to say it doesn't matter how smart you are. People can make um, conclusions or can do things that other people will label as ignorant, no matter how many degrees you have, no matter how smart you are. One of those things being coming to conclusions about something or someone before knowing them. I think in general, that may not be the most intelligent thing to do. To come to certain definite conclusions, conclusions that could ultimately affect their lives and their livelihood. And then when somebody says, well, do you know anything about them? And you say, well, no, not really. It kind of dismisses everything that you just said. Well, that not you, but a person just said. So we see that right here in this, in this um. In these statistics, a lot of people feel disdain for Muslims, and yet most Americans have no idea about the religion or the belief system. Another myth about Muslims is that they're this, they're, they're, they are racially monolithic, meaning most Muslims are of one race. Most of them look like Afghans. Most of them look like they're from Saudi Arabia. Most of them look like Osama bin Laden or Saddam Hussein. But if we look at this study that was done, I want to try to find out who the Institute of Social Policy, I believe, did this study and found that Muslims are the most eth ethnically diverse faith community on earth. Or, well, it doesn't say on earth, it just says the most ethnically diverse. I don't know if they just did this in the United States or if they did this worldwide. But either way, they're very ethnically diverse. You have 28% of them who are Black or African American, then you have 23% who are Asian, Chinese, Japanese. And then you have 19% who are white. Then you have a very small percentage, probably is the United States. You have a very small percentage who are Arab. A little smaller, Hispanic and Native American, and then other, or other and then Native American. And your book, uh, let me see where it's stated in your book. Your book actually says something kind of the same, a little bit different, I believe. Um, let me see. Oh, uh, there is racial diversity among Muslims American with 30% identifying as white. So almost double what this one says, if this is just, you know, America. 30 identify 30 percent identifying as white, 23 percent identifying as black, 21 percent identifying as Asian, and then six percent Latino, and then 19 percent mixed race. 
that's a very ethnically diverse faith group. It would be interesting to see what the Christian makeup is. I didn't do, do that one, but it would be interesting to see. Maybe you can look it up. But then when we see that, and then we think about some of the comments that have been made about Muslims and the ban on Muslims, if that's the case, then based on your reading and based on this, the people that should be banned from the country should be white and black people <laughs> if we were to do a real Muslim ban. A majority of the people who would be affected by that Muslim ban would be people who were looked either white American or who looked black American or Asian American, which would really mean that the United States would then largely belong to Latinx people <laughs> if we were going to do a real Muslim ban. But if we're honest, that Muslim ban was towards people that looked Muslim, that had the race of Muslim, that looked like they were from other countries. Also, if we look at the countries when the Muslim ban was actually instituted before it was done away with by the Supreme Court, when we look at the countries that were affected, it was largely certain countries that had uh, the racialized characteristics of Muslims, even though there were other countries that were not a part of the Muslim ban that had a larger, that had a very large Muslim population. But those countries were not part of the countries that were considered to be banned in the Muslim ban that President Trump initiated, which goes to further show that it's not just about religion, it's absolutely about race. Um, Another thing about Muslims is that they vary in their devoutness. Most people think that Muslims are what we see in that picture, extremists. They're always the ones holding up signs, burning flags, Sharia law, jihad, these very extreme Muslims. Those, that is an example of all Muslims. And what your book is telling us is that just like there is a, 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 ver a variation of people who are devout Christians, there are variation of people who are devout Muslims. Meaning, if you are a Christian, you know some Christians who drink, some Christians who don't drink, even though Christianity does not necessarily promote drinking. You know some Christians who have sex before marriage and some Christians who don't have sex before marriage. You know some Christians who go to church every Sunday. And then you know some Christians who, um, who go to church every Easter. You know some Christians that celebrate Christmas and some that. So there are all, there's a variation of devoutness when it comes to Christianity. Some Christians pray a lot, some Christians don't. Right? Some Christians smoke weed, some don't. <laughs> So there, there, there's this variation of how much of a Christian someone might be, right? That's all a part, that's what they call, that's why they call it a walk, right? There's a certain walk and you're walking with Jesus, right? It's the same way with Islam. It's the same way with Muslims. Some Muslims follow all the five pillars. Like, eh. Most Muslims don't eat pork, but you may find some that do. Most Muslims, Islam strongly prohibits drinking. I'm pretty sure you'll find some Muslims taking shots somewhere, going to happy hour somewhere. So just like Christians, they vary in their devoutness. They're not a monolithic people. They span across beliefs and across practices. <clears throat> and then lastly, Muslims and right-leaning white citizens actually have more in common than we think. Let's look at the first paragraph on page um, 112, the first paragraph under attitudes, values, and variation. It says, Muslim Americans by and large tend to be more conservative on social issues while being more liberal on foreign policy matters. 
For example, Muslim Americans are somewhat more conservative on the issue of homosexuality than the general public, where 39% of US Muslims believe that homosexuality should be accepted by society versus 58% of the general public. They are also slightly more conservative than the general public when it comes to abortion. 48% believe it should be illegal in all of most cases compared with 43% of the general population. In addition, Muslim Americans are more likely than the general public to believe that the federal government should do more to protect morality in society. And so things like homosexuality and abortion, these are ideals that are largely being anti-homosexual or being anti-abortion, at least publicly, are ideals that are more associated with right-leaning people conservatives, Republicans, right? These are, again, ideas that, if I'm just to make a sweeping generalization, most right-leaning people would lean more towards being anti-abortion, being anti-same-sex marriage. So the argument then is that Christian U.S. Americans could potentially have an ally in Muslim America. Because honestly, they have some similarities when it comes to defending the war on terror. They both believe the same thing. They both believe the same thing, same thing when it comes to certain conservative ideas. But because of hate, because people are taught to hate, because people are taught to look at people in a certain way or look at them as a monolith or look at them in this kind of general way, some people miss out and wow, we have more in common than we think. We may be able to work together on some things that we both believe in. Whether those things are right or wrong, I'm not in a position to say. Every person believes what they believe. Some people are anti-abortion. Some people are pro-abortion. I'm not here to say one or the other. But what I'm saying is when people hate, then what a person may do is they may potentially divide themselves or separate themselves from an ally from somebody who actually believes what they believe and they could possibly even come together to push a particular agenda or to preach about something that they both believe in. But that's what hate does, hate divides us. Hate divides people that could possibly work with each other to help achieve a common goal. And so with that being said, I want us to think about our own religion and our own identity. Next slide. And so under discussion questions, it's one of your assignments. Under the discussion questions, I want you to, uh, it's gonna say religion and identity, page 116, number two. And what I want you to do is I want you to answer this question. What is the role of religious beliefs in shaping your own political values and ideas? What misconceptions do others have of you based on your own religious or non-religious identity? Okay. So I want you to answer that question where it says questions for further discussion, page 116. And I want you to do that um, in a discussion question, the, the activities or the, or the rules, the, what you're supposed to do for your discussion question is right here. I, I won't read it all, but you've done it before, so you know what to do. But if you don't, they're right here. So just read it and make sure you follow along. And the discussion board, go to the last slide, religion and identity. So you're going to engage in that discussion board post entitled religion and identity. And you're going to um, make sure you all uh, fulfill all the instructions on those previous slides when you do your posts. As you do your post, you fulfill the instructions, then you respond to somebody fulfilling those instructions. And you have to do that before 1 p.m. on October 18th. So hopefully you are looking at this before that day. So you've had a whole week to look at this and prepare for this assignment. Please make sure that you're, that you're reading your PowerPoints. Please make sure that you are reading or watching the lecture videos. When you, when you see an assignment, Put it in your calendar, put it in your to-do list on Canvas if you are allowed to. 
um, put it in there so that you can remind yourself. If you don't want to do it on the same day that you look at the lectures, then you can just do it on a on a on a separate day. But this is very independent. Okay, when you do a distance learning course, it's independent. You are required to look at the videos, look at the PowerPoints, look at the lectures. And then whatever that assignment is, record it in your own calendar. Hey, I need to do this assignment on this day or it's due by this day. I give y'all a lot of days to come, you know, do a little bit of work. And most, and I'm, and most of you all are doing great. So, um, you know, this doesn't apply to most of you all. Most of you all are turning in your assignments. You're doing it well. I'm really enjoying reading them and your discussions. Um, a lot of you did well on the quiz, one. Um, so I can tell that you're paying attention, but a few people um, still may have help understanding how to see the class or want to be reminded of certain assignments. Um, I won't remind you. Again, I will put it up there. Um, I'll put it in the PowerPoint um, and I upload the PowerPoint. I encourage you to watch the PowerPoints. I encourage you to look at, you don't even have to watch the, you should watch the lecture video, but even if you just see the PowerPoint, the assignments are there and they're usually five days to a week before they're due. So all you have to do is just, even if you don't want to go to study, I wouldn't suggest not studying, but even if you don't want to study, at the very least, find out if you have an assignment. If you just want to do the assignments in the class, you can. But it's up to you. You have to, to go and do them. Okay, I'm not going to, remind you necessarily um they're there and you have a whole lot of time to complete them you have a whole lot of time so just do them again most of you all are doing very well i'm enjoying the responses and those who email me or those who inbox me about certain things i'm enjoying the conversations we're having those who enter the office hours i'm enjoying those conversations and so um yeah i look forward to more look forward to more of you engage or I look forward to engaging with more of you all right with that being said have a great week have a great weekend and see you later